So, Libiscop teachers recently finished their 6th chapter, The Heartbreaking, and when it comes a lot of lore detail about the world, characters, and especially mirror worlds, and when I say a lot, I really do mean a lot. This canto so far has been Libiscop the most jam-packed canto when it comes to lore about their franchise, and so I decided, hey, let's overanalyze this canto way too much and see what kind of details we can find by digging unnecessarily deep into it. And that is what this entire video is going to be about. Anyway, this video series is going to be a lot different from my first two voice videos and will be split into multiple parts. I plan to have one part for each corresponding part of the canto and then maybe a part 4 analyzing the mini song to Patches and Violet. Also, this video will have small segments of the original source material of Wandering Heights in it, which actually a unexpectedly big portion of you all read. But if you're that 57% majority who didn't read it, then strap in and get ready, because we are about to water some heights. The main store of Kanto 6, Heathcliff, actually starts off very differently from Kanto 5 star Israel. Israel starts off for Kanto knowing what she's gonna have to go through and acts angry and secluded. However, Heathcliff, despite also dreading what he is gonna have to face, starts out calm and collected. This is probably because Heathcliff has had enough time to just think things through and accept what's gonna happen, despite his claims of wanting to destroy everything in Wandering Heights multiple times over. Though, despite that, Honglu can still aggravate Heathcliff enough to make him consider fracturing his skull. Also, speaking of Honglu, he talks a surprising amount in his canto, and shows a lot of sympathy to Heathcliff, from giving him some small advice, arranging all the way to giving him a fresh new look. This is speculation, but he may feel sympathy for Heathcliff since they are both from a wealthy family and want to know how important this is to Heathcliff. But really, he does talk quite a lot. This canto alone, he has 55 lines and he has 249 lines in the entire game. So this canto alone accounts for about over 20% of Hong Lu's dialogue in the entire game. Which is kinda surprising how little he talks. Anyway, moving on, the group sees a civilian getting beat up for having colored hat and shoes. This is cool and all, but can we mention how this guy has genuinely chosen the worst part of his clothes to give color to? Like seriously, a hat can be so easily stolen, and shoes as well if you're desperate enough, honestly. Anyway, in the very next cutscene, the sinners help out this hopelessly stupid civilian and have a small exchange. During this exchange, dead rabbits are name dropped by the gangsters for the first time. Though, what's interesting about this is that it basically foreshadows what happened to the dead rabbits. And another interesting detail is that in the background, you can see what looks to be missing people's posters, which is likely a direct nudge to the missing people subplot that hasn't been mentioned yet at the time. Which is just a cool detail makes the setting immediately have more depth. Also, I know T-Corp is based off of industrial Britain, but I don't think this bridge follows the admittedly poor safety standards at the time. But after saving the double civilian in T-Corp, Don Quixote makes a reference to a joke in Kato 2 by intentionally avoiding using the words Limbus Company to describe themselves. Also, during this cutscene, Yi Sang explains the importance of time pieces and how they are used as a monetary system by exchanging time, but also as identification. Which was actually it directly mentioned all the way back in Kanto 4, during Yisang's memory of Encorp, where the time collectors asked the sinners to show their clocks and, and identify themselves. After the explanation, the civilian explains that kidnappings have been going on lately, which is our second hint that something wacky is going on in T-Corp and the dead rabbits. But aside from that, Dante strangely enough almost correctly predicts that the ring is behind all of this, as we know from part 2. Skipping over to the 6-5 cutscene, Mouse explains in a surprising amount of detail how T-Corp's singularity works and explains that because they have control over time, they also have control over light to an extent. She explains this in vague detail, but it is likely that what she means is that T-Corp drains time from the light itself. To give a quick explanation, the thing that gives objects color are wavelengths of light reflecting off of it, and it is likely that T-Corp singularity by harvesting time prevents these wavelengths from moving. And if it never reflects off of an object, that object is never perceived to have color. But not only can t -Corp Singularity likely manipulate wavelengths of light, but they can also seemingly exclude certain light wavelengths from their singularity as we see in a few cutscenes with the lanterns in Wandering Heights, because it is explained to us that those lanterns actually give color back to objects. Additionally to this, Faust also gives some insight on her weird habit of talking in third person by saying it takes some time to reach Faust's specific knowledge regarding t -Corp Singularity. Faust, much like Hong Lu, actually has some important lines in this canto and has popularized a recent theory that Faust has access to some sort of intelligence hive mind of other Fausts. 
Oh yeah, also in the same cutscene, Don Quixote can't decide whether red or yellow is her favorite color. Which is an adorable detail because yellow is probably her actual favorite color, but her judgment is clouded by the red mist being her favorite color fixer. The next cutscene has Vigilis mentioning that he trusts Dante and that he trusts that he doesn't have to break his contact. Which is ironic because he ends up doing the very thing later by saving the sinners. Also in this scene it is mentioned that Wandering Heights is rather windy and that Heathcliff wants to dress up well to impress Gatti. And both of these things are actually references to the original source material. So in Wandering Heights it is explained that the estate got its name from being on a really windy hill, hence the name Wandering Heights. Go figure. Also, a lot later in the book about halfway through Heathcliff, who at the time had left Wuthering Heights for three years, came back to the estate well dressed and rich. And it's obvious with Heathcliff trying to dress up well to impress Cathy that this is a little much to the book. Besides, he gets to look super handsome. I mean, look at him. He's clearly ready for the occasion and subscribe to Wellvader. You're also surprised like he is, right? Anyway, later down the line we meet Neddy. And hey, look, it's those school lanterns I was talking about earlier. We also meet Hindley and Linton soon after. Hindley and Linton are very accurate to their book counterparts, Hindley especially so down to the insult he uses to describe Heathcliff. But Nettie is a little bit different. During the book, Nettie acts as one of the two narrators, the other being a character we never get to meet in game called Mr. Lockwood. Nettie in the book often served as a voice of reasoning and pushed the plot forward by giving the other character some insight. However, with hindsight, in Limit's company we know that she is secretly the antagonist of all this, and rather than being a voice of reason, she is actually very cunning and scheming by softly pushing the sinners to do what she wants them to do, or hiding critical information from them, which you'll see later down the line. In the very next cutscene, we meet Matthew, the boss of the Dead Rabbits gang, who is definitely not someone impersonating the boss at all. In this cutscene, Dante once again has a observation that has a deeper meaning on the second playthrough. Dante makes the seemingly innocent assumption that Matthew must have known Heathcliff for a long, long time. However, the interesting thing here is that he uses the word long, long time. Sure, they are good friends, however, it's interesting that Dante describes them in that way rather than describing them as really good friends. The choice of words feels almost deliberate here by the writers to signify that yes, this person who definitely is a Matthew has known Heathcliff for a very, very long time. I sure do wonder why. Not only that, Matthew also mentions a bar named Wolf's Fall, which is of course to build up Heathcliff's trust, but, but the name Wolf's Fall almost feels like an on-the-nose hint, considering that there are a lot of wolves in this canto that end up metaphorically falling. Very clever writing, to be honest. Oh yeah, also, there's a beer brand named Heathcliff, apparently, which I guess is cool. You know, since the bar went bankrupt in the story, do you think that there's a beer world out there where Heathcliff ends up coming back to T-Corp only to buy out the bar and start his own beer brewing business? Hey, Portrait Room, can we get like a beer brewing identity for Heathcliff? Thanks. But anyway, moving on, the OV has had enough of the sinners messing around and have started the funeral rites. And funny enough, this is similar to the book, but not exactly. So in the book, Catherine did not die when Heathcliff came back to Wuthering Heights. Instead, she died soon after Heathcliff came back. This is just a small detail, but it's a really good plot point to subvert the expectation of book readers, because it fundamentally changes how the story plays out. Which I really appreciate from the writing team, actually. Also, after knocking Heathcliff out for causing a fuss over Catherine's death, then he mentions that she would not follow the orders of Linton if he wanted her to attack the sinners, because she only follows Catherine's word, which is a straight up blatant lie as we come to know later. Anyway, the next cutscene comes around, and this is where a lot of information starts getting dropped and small little details that we can overanalyze. In this cutscene, the Abyss Trauma Correctional Facility in M Corp is mentioned, which is interesting M Corp lore, and it makes sense for it to be in M Corp because of what we know of them so far. In Leviathan, they have a product called Moonstones which seems to have something to do with protecting and altering the mind. Not only that, but it is mentioned that Kati has left a warp ticket for him to M-Corp. Why is this so important, you may ask? Well, at the end of Kato 6, during the Stellar Day with Heathcliff, we see some of the sinners rummaging through the inherited items from Wuthering Heights, and it's not too far of an assumption to say that the Warp Tain event might somehow be related to the Warp Tain ticket that we have probably inherited from Hindley. And something tells me it is not going to be a VIP ticket. Also, the destination being M Corp may be relevant to Don Quixote's canto. This is because of Don Quixote's original source material. Don Quixote. Anyway, what's so important is that the ending of the book involves Don Quixote letting go of his delusions and chivalry. And considering that Don Quixote's canto will be called the dream ending, it is highly likely that M Corp with their correctional facility may somehow be involved with Don Quixote's canto. 
I guess she truly will end up getting correction. Now that is a lot to say about one cutscene, but we're not even done yet. During the cutscene, there's also a flashback, which yes, is once again a reference to Modern Height, but what isn't a reference to the book is the all-purpose tool from S-Corp that Catherine mentions. This further reinforces what we know of S-Corp and their alloys that were mentioned in Canto 5. However, this is also a really clever hint about Catherine's ambitions about becoming an inventor in the future. Anyway, soon after the flashback is when the first lightning strikes and the sinners are sent to different parts of the manor. Nettie immediately mentions that everything looks different, and it is highly likely that this is all the effects of the golden bow occurring, twisting the place around them and causing strange architecture to occur. Since we have the hindsight of knowing that the golden bows are linked to the lightning, and this started to happen as soon as the first lightning struck. This scene is also where we're starting to see really tiny hints of Nettie's scheming. She mentions that this kind of trickery Catherine would do for fun sometimes, and raises the possibility to Heathcliff that Catherine can somehow be alive still. This of course is an obvious point to bring up from her position, but it also helps steer the sinners where she wants them to go. Additionally, Nelly in a small side tangent also mentions that butlers inherit their parents' career and contracts, which is a genuinely interesting concept that is sadly not explored any further. Though she does add that breaking that contract apparently causes the Boo Hunters to show up, which is rather strange considering what we know of them so far in Distortion Detective. The Boo Hunters only go after those who break a taboo. So this insinuates one of two things, either the job is much more than just the boos, or that breaking a butler's contract is somehow severe enough to be considered considered a taboo in and of itself. Soon after this we get ambushed by Josephine and some mates. Also yes, for those who are wondering, Josephine is pretty accurate to how the character acted in the book. However, in the book Josephine is actually an old butler called Joseph. Oh yeah, also Josephine quite literally has sinking tremor burst as her skills. Anyway, upon beating them, Hindley once again has a hissy fit and says that he is going to find a dead rabbit's boss, who he refers to as Matt. This gives away to Heathcliff that something is wrong because he knows that the guy is Matthew. Though, what's fascinating is that Hindley referred to Matthew as Matt much earlier, before the thunder strike, giving this future scene away a little bit, actually. Soon after we see some dead rabbits who immediately attack us on first sight. It's weird that they're attacking us, but what is even more strange is that when you kill one of them, you can hear the faint sound of glass shattering, which is the same effect that plays when the sinner dies, which is another clue as to what is going on with the dead rabbits. After defeating them, the sinners unmask them, and the Otis mentions that they look like civilians. Heathcliff answers this by saying that they don't even have any clocks on them, which literally everyone in T-Corp carries around. Nettie then at this point does another slight trick, by raising the point of that because they don't have any timepieces on them, we don't know where they're coming from. But knowing what we know about her later downline, I think she raised that question to distract everyone from raising a far more important question. Why don't they have the timepieces on them? If someone took the moment to bring up the topic of why they don't have any timepieces in the first place, the Cinders could reasonably come to the conclusion that these are cannon fodder sent after them to stop them in their track. At this point, we know that there have been kidnappings going on, the dead rabbits are not who they used to be, and ordinary civilians seem to be behind the masks. If the sinners found out that they were cannon fodder, then they could draw a bridge between all those points and figure out that the dead rabbits have been kidnapping people to use them as cannon fodder a lot earlier. Perhaps I'm reading way too much into this and I'm becoming schizophrenic. I thought this was just a good point to bring up and showcase Nettie's clever choice of words as the secret antagonist. And speaking of Nettie being the secret antagonist, she flat out lies a second time when Heathcliff asks about the letters that have been sent to Catherine, to which she responds that she had not seen Catherine receive any letters. Speaking of Catherine, there's also a flashback to her in this scene, the background of which has some interesting details. In the background, you can see tools frequently used for construction and building stuff. This once again foreshadows Catherine's role as an inventor, but it is also great continuity, because she would have never gotten any of those tools if she had the S-Corp all-purpose tool like she wanted. Like, that's generally a great continuity detail. Anyway, up next we have a fight against some of the butlers who were searching to Catherine's room to find a diary. We fight them and I swear to all that is holy, the main enemies actually make me so I'm angry. Okay, so first off, they have an attack called counter attack. What's wrong with that, you may ask? The thing is that this is a regular attack, not a counter. This is on the same level of atrocious as 7 Association Ryosu Skill 1 being called Slash but actually doing blood damage. Moreover, Project Moon must have seen my video about the Shin Association and decided to throw all my hopes and dreams in the trash because their passive directly counters the Shin Association. I made that video because I wanted to see more Shi identities in the game, not for you to curb stomp them into the Gotham grave. I'm genuinely upset by this. 
<laughs> but you know what will make me less upset? If you watch that video after this one. But don't go now though, I still have some more overanalyzing to do. Anyway, after defeating the butlers, it is revealed that they know that the dead rabbits are suspicious because they're supposed to be long gone. They also told us that they're here to find a diary and couldn't find it. But Heathcliff gets a flashback above where Cathy could have potentially hidden it and finds the diary hidden inside one of the pillows. Which is really ironic because in the background we can see that the butlers have torn open one of the two pillows. Which signifies that they either really suck at their job or are just really unlucky. Also, there's something I want to point out with this flashback. Do you notice anything old perhaps? I'll give you like 3 seconds to figure it out. Okay, three seconds are over. Do you see it yet? Well, if you didn't, look at the feathers. They have color. So this means that Catherine has straight up paid for colors on each individual feather only to throw them away. My god, girl, I know that you are rich, but you don't have to flex your wealth like that. And I know what you're about to say. Oh, well, Vader, what about those lanterns that restore color? Well, guess what? There are literally none of those lanterns around in the background of this art. Sure, they could be off to the side because we don't see any on the back or right side of the room. However, you might not have noticed that every background art so far up until this point had lanterns in them in some sort of capacity. Like, seriously. We could go back to the previous background and you'll see a lantern around, except for this background. There could of course be lanterns that we don't see in this cutscene, however, it is funnier to believe that either 1. Catherine paid for all those feathers just to throw them away, or 2. The feathers just somehow defy the laws of physics and singularity as we know it. Though, you know what will always retain its colors despite t -Corp's singularity? That's right, it's that juicy red subscribe button. Consider clicking it if you're enjoying my increasingly more over-analytical ramblings. Clicking it is also set to bring good luck and give a triple zero out of the in your next temple. Trust me, then he can confirm it. Anyway, the very last cutscene of part 1 has us facing off against a bunch of Linter's butlers. And after revealing that we have the diary to him and that we can read it, he just kinda gives up. Linton here also takes the blame for discarding Heathcliff's letters. Obviously to anger him, but also to completely cross out the thought that Nanny could have burned them instead. Making her reveal as a twist villain later on more painful. Now that's cool and all, but Don Quixote mentions the existence of Fixer's Money magazine since her encounter with Secret. And personally, I want to know more lore on that. Anyway, with that being done, we descend down the basement and go on to part 2. Now, originally I was going to do an extra section talking about the Battle Pass Egos and their story relevance and meaning near the end. But this video is already getting way too long for what I usually do, so I'll be saving that for the other parts coming out in the next few weeks. Speaking of, you should watch those videos when they come out. And if you've liked the video, consider subscribing and hitting that like button, as it shows me that you enjoy these kinds of videos and want to see more of them. So look forward to more overanalyzing, such as the fairy tale that Earl King Heathcliff is based off of, and the mythology that the Wild Hunt is based off of. Also consider taking a look at some of my other voice videos if you really enjoy these kinds of videos. I actually really enjoy making this video in particular. I read the modern hype novel before Kando 6 came out, and it ended up being one of my favorite books of all time. And coincidentally enough, this canto is also what made Limit's Company my number one favorite game of all time, as some of you may know from my stream that I do with Axel. So in a sense, this video series is kind of like a love letter to Project Moon and their excellent team for making Canto 6 and making me absolutely fall in love with Limit's Company. Though, Project Moon, as much as I love you guys, I am still expecting my 300 lunacy for pointing out the inconsistency with the feathers in the pillow.